And yeah, we about to give you game Shout out to Steve Train Real estate disrupt us They cannot touch us And yeah, we about to give you game Shout out to Steve Train Jump on the Steve Train We about to give you game R.E.I.'s flowing through my veins And you don't have to look no further See right here, you gon' learn everything Shout out to Steve Train Jump on the Steve Train We real estate disrupt us See, we real estate disrupt us Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors Today we have Dan Bro with House Buyers Club And he's from Rochester, New York To talk about how he went from struggling to massive debt To paying off his debt in less than 12 months if this is your first time tuning in, I am Steve Trang, founder of the OfferFast Homes app, the only MLS for off-market wholesale properties, and I'm on a mission to create 100 millionaires. Uh, we do have our workshop coming up, coming up in three weeks. If you want to see if you qualify, please go to disruptors.com. And if you get value, guys, today, please tag a friend below, share this episode, comment, so on. If you guys can really do this, it would help us a lot because that way we can all grow together uh, because a rising tide does lift all boats. And this is a live show, so please ask your questions for Dan to answer. You ready? Ready. All right. So first question is, what got you into real estate? I've always liked houses. Uh, and when I was, when I first started in real estate, I was in the medical device field and I was looking into retirement investing and didn't like the options I saw. Yeah, and started reading some real estate books. Uh, saw all the advantages that it had, long term and short term, and uh, thought I could do that too. So, you didn't like your options you saw as in like four hundred one k or yeah, yeah, just the uncertainty, <laughs> the lack of control. You know, I have a right. little bit of a control thing. <laughs> sure. So, um, yeah, it just seemed way more appealing to me the the cash flow the ask the depreciation the equity gain just right. made sense to me so what books were the ones that opened your eyes so i think pretty much everyone that's been on this show has probably read rich dad poor dad um god I, honestly i've read so many books i, I don't even remember them all um <laughs> i read i went through i talked to every real estate investor i could find in rochester and mm -hmm. and interviewed them and read every book you know even house flipping for dummies rental properties for dummies all all those i i read as much as i could why well, I, I really like that part where you went to go talk to everyone all the other investors in rochester because that's kind of how i started was i always interviewed right i can i pick your brain can I go to lunch and so on mm -hmm. so that's what you did so talk to t talk to everyone how was that experience i learned a lot i mean a lot about what i wanted to do and what i didn't want to do you know, not all these guys were thrilled with what they had done, the businesses they had built. Um, really? Yeah, just, you know, landlords, uh, tenants are a pain. <laughs> mm, gotcha. Uh, you know, areas to stay out of, you know, some of those city properties, they look like they cash flow really well, but then you look at who's inside them mm -hmm. and the, t the headaches you have to deal with. So right. that helped me steer away from that. Yeah. Um, Can't make decisions based on just the cap rate. Right. Right. It's not always what it seems. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So when was that when you were like investigating your options and as which direction to go? Yeah, that was, I started all this about five years ago. So started out, uh, flipped my first house, did all the work myself. That was a mistake. Um, it was a disaster. I've never done that again. Why was that a disaster? Just, I hated it. <laughs> about every second of it. Um, it took me away from, from my wife. Well, we weren't married at the time yet, but um, you know, I was I had a full time job, and then I would go there after work on weekends. It just took up all my time, uh, and I didn't really know what I was doing that much. It was I was learning on the job, and you know, I think we maybe broke even on it. But uh, you know, my first time, I, I made so many mistakes. Well, you're also working full time too. Yeah, yeah. So you didn't quit to go do real estate yet. No, not at that point. Okay, not so. Yet. What was that journey? So the first flip was a mistake. I mean, mm -hmm. what I've said to people before, if you don't lose money in your first flip, you actually came out ahead. <laughs> right. Right, because you get to learn a lot on that first one. Yeah. 
So did you continue on this flipping like progress? Like what did you do? Yeah, after that, so I started acquiring a few rental properties and then decided after that experience of doing the work myself and how well that went, uh, decided to hire some crews to do the work. And so at that point I got, I got a pretty good crew. There was about six guys that were doing all the work and they were able to do pretty much everything. Uh, and so they were, they renovated some houses that I kept as rentals and then the most of them we were just flipping. Okay, so you're managing the crews and you're flipping. At which point, because we've talked about you had some large machinery. Yeah. <laughs> was this in that time period or? This was a few years later. Okay. So yeah, so I was still probably full time in the medical device field for about a year until I decided to go full time in real estate. Got it. Um, and that's when I really started to go do some bigger things. Um, so about, well, it all ended about a year ago. So it started about two years ago. I, I took a shot at a historic luxury flip. Um, we thought it would sell for a lot more than it did and thought it would cost a lot less than it did. Um, so let's talk about that deal. Because yeah. I think this this is a part of your story. Yeah. Right? Like you don't get to where you are without this specific house. Mm, yeah. So what was this house? So let's talk about the house. Yeah, it was this in in a village of this pretty, I don't want to say ritzy, but one of the nicer towns in Rochester. Mm -hmm. And it was this historic property, one of a kind. Um, we thought, hey, this you know one of a kind property has all this history. It's going to sell for this big number. Um, so it, how did you how did you come across that deal? A bandit sign. Bandit signs. Bandit so you sign. have bandit. You're putting out bandit signs. Yep. So you're wholesaling also, or you're only flipping at that time. At that time, I was wholesaling a little bit. Okay. I really wasn't focusing on it at all. I I started wholesaling because I I got these. I was buying deals from wholesalers, mm -hmm. and I saw the fees that they were making. I was like, I can do that. Like, <laughs> I don't want to pay that to them. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I just want to get that deal on my own. Yeah. Um, so I started doing that a little bit. Okay. Just really just doing bandit signs at first. So you're doing bandit signs. Yep. And you get this lead mm -hmm. in this house you go to it like did you know about the how distinctive it was before you yeah it, it had one of those plaques out front um it was like it you had, see in the movies like where they got the plaques like the history and everything. yeah okay yeah so it was on the historic registry mm -hmm. um it was an old Masa it was first the the first schoolhouse in the village and then they transformed it to a masonic temple mm -hmm. um and then it was they they vacated that and then i turned it into a single family home okay so it wasn't a home when you it bought was it. never a house okay so what were you able to buy it for bought it for 200. okay and what was your expectation we thought it would sell for about a million yeah okay. and what because we all yeah. are super optimistic as entrepreneurs uh -huh. we see the <laughs> best case scenario That's right. every time what was it that caused you to think it was going to sell for a million? You know, we had a room full of smart, experienced people comping it out, looking at the neighborhood, looking at the history, um, seeing some other houses that were on the market that were not too far from there. Mm -hmm. um, and just thought based on the level of finish that we were going to put in there, that that's what we would get. Okay. So you had smart people confirming it wasn't just your crazy idea. Right. So smart people verified it should yeah. sell for a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Acquired for two hundred. Yeah. What was the renovation? Six hundred thousand dollars. Six hundred thousand dollars. Why was it so much? Gosh. There must have been a so few lessons in there. Many mistakes. <laughs> Let's call them lessons. <laughs> lessons. Um. Gosh. It. We had to gut the entire thing. Mm -hmm. We we rebuilt the whole house except for the exterior siding, which was cobblestone. Okay. So we took it. I mean, we, every single floor, wall, ceiling, we had to reframe. Each window is a, in, in a historic neighborhood, so we had to do everything like it was original. Mm -hmm. Each window, there were twenty four windows in the in the house, cost three thousand dollars per window. Okay. It added up real fast. Yeah, it did. Uh, we put in, I mean, we did everything. It came out beautiful, mm -hmm. but it cost way too much. Were there, so one lesson maybe about the windows and historic homes. 
right? Which you sometimes have to learn. <laughs> what were two, two other lessons that might have came out of that? Every If you're flipping a house, it's going to take a lot longer and cost a lot more than you think it will. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you're getting into this. Was there a point where you're like, screw it, or let's just sell it in its current condition? Was throwing in a towel at some point a consideration? I really wanted to finish it. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to fire a lot of contractors on the job. Yeah. A lot. And were you doing this on the side or were you full time at this point? I was full time at that point. Okay. Yeah. So this was that one job took up almost all my time. And how long was that project? That took a year. So a year. Yeah. Kicking your ass. Bad. <laughs> 600,000 in rent and renovations. Yeah. What did you end up selling it for? Gosh, I honestly sometimes even forget because it was such a nightmare. Uh, we started the price out at like nine seventy five, I think, which is in line. And and then we we did so many price drops, it was ridiculous. It was on the market for a while. Um, I ended up losing at least one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on that job. Okay, it was nuts. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Was it because of the lofty sales price going way over budget or dealing with contractors? Like what was the ultimate cause of that? Man, I, I have to, I have to take the blame. Mm -hmm. I mean, I found out, I learned a lot about myself in that process. I bet. Uh, one of which is that I hate managing people, especially contractors. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the last flip I did. Oh, really? That was the last flip. That was the last flip I did. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I yeah, managing people and managing contractors, I I can do it. I've done it before. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. It drives me nuts. Um, and you know, I'm I tend to be optimistic, and yeah. I sometimes that that helps me out because I go for things mm -hmm. and I take chances. And lately, they've really worked out well. Uh, but on this one, it was a big swing and a big miss. Gotcha. So. You know, one of the things we're talking about was paying off personal debt. Mm -hmm. So the hundred fifty thousand loss on that one, mm -hmm. you didn't have that all in your bank account. No. <laughs> Where did that loss come from? So that and that was only part of it. Mm -hmm. At that same time, while I was wrapping up that job, I had started another company. We were, oh. yeah great idea yeah uh we were I, I thought it was gonna work yeah. <laughs> um we had started a development company mm -hmm. we were going to be building houses and a lot of which we were going to keep as for our portfolio mm -hmm. uh put the main operations running the crews and the construction in the hands of a very skilled craftsman uh and honestly i was blinded by his skill because he was as a craftsman top notch mm -hmm. Uh, he wasn't at all who I thought he was. And he ran those crews and jobs into the ground. And we had we had six full-time guys. We had a couple other part-time guys. Mm -hmm. We had some big machinery, uh, I think three or four large pieces of machinery, you know, fifty, seventy thousand dollar pieces of machinery. Yeah. Um, that we ran out of money. That everything was just being mismanaged i was probably taking on too much mm -hmm. at that time um i put too much trust in him too soon and that company just fell apart when you say ran the crews and the projects to the ground what does that mean like he he uh was not for as much as i say i don't like managing people and i'm not good at it um, he would tell me one thing and then the employee would come in and tell me a completely different story about how mm. they were being treated. Got it. And so, uh, you know, I never witnessed it in person because he, I think he always put on one face in front of me. Uh, but according to these other guys, he treated them like garbage. Really? And, you know, people were, people were quitting and all the time. And the jobs were constantly over time, over budget. And we were in the middle of building someone's house and we ran out of money. Yeah. And I had to shut down the company. I had to lay off six guys. I had to surrender, voluntarily surrender all that machinery uh, 
as a result of all that. I mean, legal fees, all that machinery that I had to pay off. Legal fees? What legal fees? That homeowner. Mm. She wasn't happy. Yeah, I bet she was not. No. Um, that, that was, I mean, this was the most stressful period of my life by far with those two things going on at the same time. And what year was this? Last year. So 2019. This was last year. So 2019, you've got this company, which you felt would be going pretty good. Yeah. Got ran into the ground. Mm -hmm. And then you finished because you didn't sound like you didn't start this flip, but you finished the flip. Finished the flip. In 2019. So what was your, what were you in the hole on the, on the development side that company at least 175 probably a little bit more after yeah. all said and done i mean together between the two at least 350 yeah. in debt and the thing that's crazy is i don't think it's crazy to take on two projects right it definitely sucks like crazy to have two <laughs> projects go south yeah but that's kind of what we do as entrepreneurs we take on <laughs> projects like oh we can do this um, I'll just do a quick aside. Uh, so last week I bought my daughter a bike. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you see my tiny car and we had to take the wheels off to put the bike in the car. <laughs> and I feel like this, this guy set me up for failure when he asked me this question, how confident are you that you can put the tires back on <laughs> as a guy? There's no answer except right. of course I can do it. Right. Man, that took 30 minutes too long <laughs> 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 to put the wheel back on. Oh. So. So we have this problem where we think we can do everything. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing right. because like you said, you, you're, you're where you are because, because you took chances. Yeah. So what about, you know, you're talking about 350 in a hole now between the two projects, you didn't have that money in the bank. No. <laughs> so what did you do? That was a really tough time. Uh, I mean, we, I had to liquidate my 401k I sold my truck. We were selling stuff out of our house. Uh, honestly, if it wasn't for my parents, mm -hmm. I would have had to declare bankruptcy. Got it. It was really bad. It was, so I married some, with a newborn. <laughs> married at that point. Yeah, our daughter was one. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I say stress, I had, you know, they say, you know, sick to your stomach. Mm -hmm. I got an ulcer. Like oh, I really? was going to the doctor. Oh, it was bad. Got it. Like barely sleeping. I mean, it's just sitting up at night wondering how am I going to deal with this? Mm -hmm. It was, it was by far the most stressful year of my life. Nothing, nothing comes close. And then at this point you decided to go back to get a job. Yeah. I, I was like, I'm done with real estate. <laughs> Screw this. Not worth it. <laughs> Those books were all a no sham. way. <laughs> I, I was my, my risk profile went from I'll take on anything mm -hmm. to I need something steady. Yeah. I just need, I, I put my wife through hell. Our, we have a little daughter. I need to provide some security, some stability. I can't let this happen. Yeah. Like we need to get back on track because before all that happened, we were doing great. Right. And then everything just went downhill real fast. Yeah. And so I went back into medical device sales and that was just about the beginning of this year. And I was fortunate enough to find something pretty quickly with mm -hmm. the company I used to be with. Gotcha. Um, and I mean, that was, I was blessed to get that at a time where I was more stressed than I'd ever been in a financial spot I'd never experienced before. Uh, to get that was a huge blessing. Gotcha. And then we connected at some point around this time. So shortly after so i had been there so that started the beginning of this year mm -hmm. and then so i was in so medical device i was in the sur in surgeries i was in the operating room covid hit so but you were you were actually inside yeah operating rooms yeah okay yeah advising the surgical team on how to use our stuff wow okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> pretty cool job that's yeah um, it's interesting <laughs> yeah um i mean it was great I, it was i was doing really well i had this new position that they created just for me to come back into the company to make it work and so i was doing some traveling and advising people all around the northeast on these new products oh that's cool yeah um and then COVID hit and surgeries just stopped right overnight and so thankfully you know my boss was nice enough to be giving me a salary still but I wasn't eligible for any commission because there was no surgeries going on. Mm -hmm. And you know me, I, I can't sit still. I can't yeah. do nothing. And so 
I looked back and I said, well, there's there's still a lot of money in real estate. I'm not going to flip. Uh, <laughs> never doing that. Yeah. Um, wholesaling, I had done it before. I didn't love it, uh, but it was always the margins were great. And I said, well, I know there's a better way to do it. I know there's other people who are doing this well and enjoying it and doing the process better than what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. So I said, I got to get a coach. I, I need I need someone to guide me on this journey because I know I can put it together. I just don't want to do it on my own because I know I've been trying that. I've been trying to do it on my own. Right. It's not working that great. I can learn from other people who've already had that success. Mm -hmm. And so I just started doing some research. I was watching some videos. I found one of your podcasts and it's like, give that guy a call. Yeah. And then here we are. Yeah. So you went. <laughs> At that time, so this is like right when COVID struck, so like around April, March or April. Yeah. And so we scheduled a call, we mm -hmm. jump on. So at that time, real estate, there was no transactions. There was no right. wholesales, no flips, nothing. You weren't, you were like, you tried it, that ship has sailed, I'm done. Yeah, I was doing no real estate at that point. Okay. So we we worked together, right? We scheduled a call, worked together. What were the things that you say, the keys that really changed really unlocked all this for you what were some of the major keys yeah so those lessons i learned last year you know the value of other people mm -hmm. that just to have that community that support the value of other people's experience and knowledge and so that just completely shift my mindset and I mean, you can imagine that was a very humbling experience oh, last yeah. year oh yeah um and so i I just, my mind just sort of switched. I said, you know, there are so many people that do so well at so many different things mm -hmm. and I can learn from them. Yeah. And not just from books, because I constantly read. Yeah, uh, I but, was intimidated by how many books were behind you when we did our call. <laughs> uh, so not just from books, but from actually interacting, taking coaching programs, mentorships. Um, and then the, I mean, you guys just put everything together. Yeah. And it's not just because I'm sitting here with you now. I mean, I talk about this to anyone that asks that it's you've labeled it correctly. It's the blueprint. Mm -hmm. It it gives you everything you need. And if you actually take action on it consistently, you're going to get the results. It, wholesaling isn't that complicated. No, it's if you're decent, if you're halfway decent at sales and you're into personal development and you're constantly trying to get better you're going to have success in wholesaling. Right. So the systems that you guys created and taught, I just put that into play and consistently took action on it. And it completely changed my business. Yeah. But the thing is, like, we've coached a lot of people. And then you kind of like flew out of the gate. <laughs> so for people, because you kind of touched on a little bit about consistent action, you want to emphasize that a little bit more because there's a lot of people that will learn mm -hmm. but there's something different that separates so what do you think that is a lot of people talk about massive action mm -hmm. that's not what gets success that's yeah. that's it's never one big thing that gets you there it's the little things every day that's it's not the sexy stuff yeah it's the day in day out work that is behind the scenes that no one sees. It's the hours of role playing. It's the constantly adjusting the script to fit my style. Yeah. It's working on my CRM so that the process flows nicely. It's finding it's every little thing. It's doing something each day to get a little bit better. That's going to make the big difference over time. Right. And when you combine that with my background in personal development, I mean, my, you know, you saw that picture of Tony Robbins holding me when I was like two or three. Yeah. And so that's just been around me for a long time. I think his, what is it, his personal power to program, mm -hmm. it's CDs, it's like 30 days of CDs. Oh, yeah. I've probably listened to that 15 times at least, and it's a full 30 day program. Really? Um, I started, I finished it once. I tried starting a second time. It's intense. Yeah. <laughs> and with the journal and everything and doing yeah. the whole, I, I, 
I, my dad gave that to me when I was in high school at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but he, you know, he worked with Tony Robbins. He had a Tony Robbins franchise. So that was just always sort of what I grew up with. And I just really latched onto it. Mm -hmm. So taking that personal development side of things and then combining it with the great system and me moving very quickly with things in general, yeah. it just took off. Yeah. Yeah. So I think absolutely just everything that you're able to do, I think it's incredible. Uh, so you were already in medical device sales. Mm -hmm. Killed it? I was doing well. Okay. So now you've gone through our sales training. What's different? The This system, it's so different from pretty much every sales method that you'll you'll learn out there for the most part. I mean, yeah. most of it's a lot of questions, trying to get as many yeses as you can. Mm -hmm. um, it, with this one, I'm basically telling people not to sell to me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm asking very few questions. It's it, it's really interesting. It wouldn't seem like it works. It works amazingly well. It shouldn't work. It shouldn't. <laughs> not, it does. With everything we know, it just shouldn't work. <laughs> it shouldn't. <laughs> but it works so well. I, I mean, so many, it's, it's statements not mm -hmm. questions yeah it's you're making a lot of assumptions and you're voicing it mm -hmm. and seeing how they react yeah and and just using that and just it, it's incredible how well it works um so it's none of those yes no questions there's a few at the beginning mm -hmm. after that there's almost no questions right it's you know as you said the other day it's you're making statements that behave like open-ended questions exactly and that's it works so well. It's incredible because, like you said, people love to correct you. <laughs> and so if you make a statement that they don't agree with, they will correct you and tell you all the reasons why you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And then they're just selling themselves at that point. Exactly. Yeah, I love it. OK, so um, the systems, the the processes, the sales, the selling mindset, mm -hmm. you, you attribute a lot of that to basically, I mean, if there was like a comeback player of the year, I mean, that's, I think that's kind of like the award you would win, right? In, in wholesaling. So is that, did I, did I get that right? Yeah. I think the consistency mm -hmm. of the program as well, you know, having the frequency of the calls because you can learn something and maybe you'll be a little bit better afterwards. Mm -hmm. But when you keep practicing that, you take something new each time and you get yeah. a little, you keep getting a little bit better. And so you're on this upward trajectory. And so that's where I see the big value in the program being for a longer period of time where we're constantly working, we're constantly learning new things and we're going over a lot of the same stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's so much value in that because as you gain new experience in the marketplace, you're talking to new people, you have new things to reflect on. And so something that we're suddenly working on, you have a different perspective on it and then you understand it in a totally different way. Right. Because you're actually doing it. Um, so you had sent me a vision board or a picture of a vision board. You want to talk about that? Cause I think this is good for a lot of people that are actually watching right now. Yeah. The message between us, the, the vision board, the picture, like what was on your vision board? You were saying like you were going to be here one day. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So we, oh my gosh, that conversation, it seems like it was so long ago. But it wasn't that really long ago. It wasn't that long ago. No, it was earlier this year. Um, I think I, I said something like, you know, I, I can't wait to be on the show. Mm -hmm. And and you said, you're going to be one of my busy, biggest success stories. Yeah. Can't wait to have you on. Yeah. And that's up in my office right above my computer. And I thought it would be. I was like, I'm going to I'm going to get on the show. I can do it. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it'd be this quick. No, I, I don't know if anyone would expect to be this quick, but I think that's awesome, right? So I think that's a testament. I mean, selfishly or self-biased, you know, I think our, our system has helped. But at the end of the day, it doesn't happen without you taking the consistent action, which is something you guys heard me say a few times in the introduction. The key is consistent action, not massive action. Um, and so I want to talk about front row dads, but before we get to there, yeah. one thing you mentioned uh, is... Uh, the managing the people that you haven't enjoyed it. Not your most favorite thing to mm -hmm. do. And so we recently, uh, uh, actually today, we we're talking about predictive index. Yeah. And it's something that uh, Eric Brewer was here on the show last week. We we're talking about predictive index. So you want to talk about how that tool has helped you bring on your, your chief integration officer? 
Yeah. So the predictive index, I wish I knew about it a long time ago. Me too. Even just for my own, for myself, for analyzing myself and my personal relationships. Um, but it, it's amazing how accurate it is. Uh, it really, so Mike, the, the guy who's facilitating mm -hmm. the predictive index was going through my results and he said, so at this time you were, you were probably going through this type of thought <laughs> process and you're probably this type of experience. And I hadn't told him any of this stuff. It was right. like, he was a fortune teller mm -hmm. and the accuracy of it is incredible. And so it, it allows you to really hone in on what you're good at, what your natural tendencies are, and then how you interact with other people, how you should maybe change some things based on your personality and who you're dealing with. Yeah. And then also you can create on there, the great part about that for hiring, you can create these job profiles and there's so many other people that have done that before. And so you can match it up to past people who've done it, mm -hmm. say, this is generally the type of profile you're going to want for this type of job. Right. And people submit their results and you see how well they match up. And it gives you this whole guide of how to, how to interview them and, and even how you're going to interact with them and what you might need to adjust based on their style. And so based on all that, I, I learned about myself, like, Hey, I'm a super driver, literally off the chart. Um, couldn't get any higher. There was the arrow pointing all the way off the chart mm -hmm. saying you are at, in, in need of more control than pretty much anyone else. Yeah, you're extreme. <laughs> um, I'm very, very low on the patience scale <laughs> about, uh, two standard deviations less yeah. than the norm. Um, uh, so for needing to be in a ton of control, having low patience, having a little bit lower on the, the extrovert side, more introverted. Mm -hmm. I'm just not the best person for managing people. I just, I, I move too quick and I'm too impatient and I probably don't explain things as well as I could. And so I'm great if someone has a baseline level of knowledge and I'm just mm -hmm. there to like get them to the next level. Yeah. But it was the same thing in my personal training days. Like if I had to deal with a newbie, I, I couldn't stand it. <laughs> it. It just drive me nuts. Like having to teach them the very yeah. basic stuff. Yeah. Uh, but taking someone from they had some experience to that next level. That was my key. That yeah. was where I was the best. Awesome. So, so guys, that's a plug for predictive index. But if you guys aren't convinced, you guys can send me a message either on Instagram or Facebook. I'll post a link to this later on as well, where you guys can take the predictive index test. I've offered it before. So it's really crazy how accurate it is. And it wasn't until I took it that I realized like what's wrong with me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> why i i can collaborate with just about anybody but man being in a situation where i'm not like the majority decision maker mm -hmm. i can't do it yeah. like i can't have someone make decisions <laughs> for me i just it just won't work all right so one thing that you and i were talking about uh also was front row dads and it's something you're really passionate about and i think it's something that a lot of us when we get into this business we do it you know it, it's either for the money or for the time or both mm -hmm. i want to have more time I want to have more money yeah. or whatever. We all have this mindset and then we get into this business and we completely forget all about it. Yeah. And all we're doing is hustle and grind, hustle and grind. You see like memes all the time about hustling and grinding. Yeah. And so everyone's trying to see who can work more hours in a week. Mm -hmm. But you're taking a different approach. I'm working on it. Front row dads. I'm working on it. Yeah. So, you know, as things have scaled really quickly for my business, uh, I found my my time wasn't a good reflection of my priorities and family for me, you know, I, I lived in California for a year. I moved back to the East coast because of family, mm. not for the weather, <laughs> uh, certainly not for the weather in upstate New York. I hear Rochester's great. <laughs> yeah. This time of year. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. You should come. <laughs> uh, and so as I was getting busier and busier, I, I was, I was finding, you know, I, I'm, doing stuff after five, I'm doing stuff on the weekends for work. I'm mm -hmm. constantly answering emails, text messages for buyers, sellers. I, I was totally unbalanced. And so a, a buddy of mine was a part of this group and he had mentioned it to me called Front Row Dads. And their whole motto is family men with businesses, not businessmen with families. Mm -hmm. And that resonated to me 
really strongly uh, because I saw myself going down this path and I was thinking if I keep going down this path there's a big business and a lot of money down it mm -hmm. but my schedule is gonna be awful it's it, it's gonna I'm gonna sacrifice the things that are really the most important which are the relationships the why you're doing this right and well that's where so many people go wrong they say I'm working so hard for my family mm -hmm. that's not true yeah you're doing it for yourself of course you're doing it for the things you can buy with it and for the clout and for social media mm -hmm. and not because it's going to make you so much happier right because really money can buy only so much mm -hmm. if you lose all your relationships in the process you're going to be miserable right there are plenty of billionaires billionaires out there that are miserable mm -hmm. because they ruined all the relationships in the process yeah and i saw what the business could become because i see all the people that are having so much success in it but i wasn't willing to sacrifice on the relationship side and so i needed to be surrounded by a group of people that had those same values and this group there are high level guys in there um guys that i mean multi-millionaires run big big businesses um, guys from all over the world and that is their focus family first mm -hmm. while still operating really great businesses and so you know I, i'm i'm a new member i just joined maybe three four weeks ago yeah but i'm blown away i mean we just had a, a full day online summit and i learned so much more than i thought i was going to and i mean for anyone out there who's thinking about their life being a little bit out of balance in terms of work and family and need to reprioritize and really start focusing on those people that are those relationships that are truly the most important and you want some role models to learn from and collaborate with it's the best group out there yeah i mean it's it's i'm blown away by it yeah and i think it's powerful and i think it's you know for everyone to you know again the reason why we get into this business but then once you get in the business, you completely forget about it. Yeah. And so one of the questions I've heard before, and I think it's powerful, is you know everyone says they're doing it for the family. But if I were to pull up on your calendar, would your calendar reflect right. that you're doing it for your family? That's right. And I think that's a really good point that you just hit on because we say it, but really we make enough money where we can stop. Right. Right. Or not that we could stop, but we don't have to go this hard. Right. Right. We can go 75, 80 percent mm -hmm. and still maintain pretty solid income. But well, growth is so addictive. It is. It's you. You have success, and you see all the things you can do, and you're like, "Well, I just want to get it bigger. Mm -hmm. I want to do more." Yeah. It's not always better. It's not always better, but it's also what gets us out of bed. Right. It's that chase. It's a tough balance. Yeah. I mean, for for hard driving entrepreneurs, that's probably one of the most difficult things mm -hmm. is balancing how much growth do you really need versus taking a little bit of a step back and focusing on those relationships yeah it's a it's it's tough i think that's probably one of the biggest challenges that entrepreneurs have oh it's absolutely one of the biggest challenges and that's why i've said before like it's not it's tough being an entrepreneur but it's gotta be tougher being married to one <laughs> <laughs> we put our wives through hell i um, believe that <laughs> and so uh i i kind of had this mental exercise i was talking to one of the guys that i mentor um if we just because the way we're wired mm -hmm. If someone just dropped $10 million in my bank account, $50 million in my bank account, would I stop? No. I would just try to figure out how, what, what can I do with <laughs> right. this? How can we get bigger? Yeah. How can we get faster? And yeah. it's just the way we're wired. Right. Yeah. So I think that's awesome that you, you, you're intentional with this. You're focused on it because a lot of people kind of just, you know, they just keep driving and driving. And I think that's awesome that you, you, you took your, you reminded yourself and had the presence of mind uh, to, to, to look at that. So for a lot of these guys that are listening, so we're talking about paying off 350,000 personal debt yeah. to your parents mm -hmm. in six months. It's crazy to fathom. So I think people need to know what do your numbers look like? Yeah. Uh, it's honestly, it's still mind blowing to me. Yeah. Uh, just how different of a place we're in from one year ago. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I, when that, all that happened, I said, I'm never letting this happen again. And I'm going to get so far from it that we never have to worry about this again. Yeah. And so right now we're averaging about, it varies because we're constantly changing, changing things. Um, Entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> but this month so far, I think I've signed 13 contracts. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, some of those have, have fallen through for various reasons, but um, we'll probably finish this month with about 10 deals. Yeah. So for, I mean, for where we're at in the business for, you know, really only doing this six months full time, I'm thrilled with that progress. Yeah, I don't think anyone can complain about that. Yeah. So uh, for everyone listening, because uh, it's not necessarily easy to replicate what you've done. I wish I could say, hey, everyone just go do what Dan's done right. and replicate it. But there are some restrictions. So, or challenges that you may f uh, run into mm -hmm. trying to replicate what you've done. So uh, for people listening right now, what is your number one lead source? So recently we started up with TV and it's been incredible. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we've gotten since, since then in our group, I think four, four or five other, other guys have signed mm -hmm. up for TV because yeah. of the results they've seen, uh, me have so far. Mm -hmm. And so that's the number one, but we've been constantly changing. I mean, we've yeah. over the past six months, you know, we were doing texting. We haven't done cold calling. We we're doing bandit signs. We we're doing some online marketing, Facebook stuff. Yeah, you were doing a lot of Facebook marketing. I remember that. Direct mail. Um, and now we're really just focusing on TV because it's it's been so great. Yeah. So you were on, you're already on this um, direction, right? You're already on this momentum. So you're doing a lot of texting. Mm -hmm. So when we first started working together, you were doing texting and Facebook marketing. Yeah. And then it's evolved. Well, you were doing direct mail the whole time too. Actually, you want to share everyone what your direct mail trick is because no one, no one's doing direct mail the way you're doing. Yeah. It. Um, well, for the full details, <laughs> <laughs> the course is coming. Yeah. Uh, but I have, yeah, I, I've set up a system where I can get handwritten direct mail out for less than sixty cents a letter. Yeah. Um, and our our response rate is one point six five percent. 1.65? Yeah. That's really good. It's really good. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't sound, I know it doesn't sound great for anyone who's not done direct mail. Yeah, if you don't know direct mail, that, that sounds not terrible. But for direct mail, that's double for, industry average. For direct mail, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and at a lot lower cost than if you try to get handwritten letters anywhere else, real handwritten letters by an actual person. Yeah, not a Not machine. a robot. Not, not printed out. It's actually handwritten. Uh, it'll cost you three, four bucks a letter. Yeah. So um, set up a system, which I plan on launching a course for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's that's been great because the response rate has been phenomenal. And it's it's I, I don't have to manage that at all. Right. It's it's fully set up. Um, that's a great system. Yeah. So direct mail. TV. Where are you with texting? Stopped. Stop doing it. Stop texting altogether. Okay. I think we stopped three weeks ago or so mm -hmm. um you know it was going great for a while really good really good and i probably even got into texting pretty late in the game compared to when it was at its high yeah um but i just i was tracking the numbers and every maybe what was it two two months ago mm -hmm. it just started to go downhill mm -hmm. just the return wasn't there anymore yeah and it's such a management intensive method of marketing mm -hmm. you have to you can't have a robot send it a person has to send it and then you yeah. have to monitor that you have to do quality control um it's a lot of people management which i don't want to be in that business <laughs> <laughs> i want to have the leanest team possible got it or at least someone else running that team yeah i don't want to be managing those people so for me it was an easy choice the the return was going down it was taking more and more to get the same number of leads. Mm -hmm. um, there was so much competition. And so the calls, the, the response when when a homeowner is getting contacted by 10, 11, 12 people, there's, they get sort of nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Do they? They're not the best conversations. They're yeah. not thrilled to talk with you. Yeah. Uh, and so, I, you know, I didn't, I never loved doing that. I was mm -hmm. just doing it because the deals were there. Yeah. Uh, and then once... I actually, I forget what book I read, but it was, it, it talked about concentration risk mm -hmm. and how if you are t 
too focused on any one thing, that's where all your liability is. Mm -hmm. And so if that one marketing method goes downhill, your business goes away. Yeah. And so for me, hearing about all these regulations, that all these carrier restrictions, mm -hmm. you know, them saying, sending these automated messages at the end of your text, like if you want to opt out, say end or whatever mm -hmm. it was. And so there were all these restrictions and I just saw the writing on the wall and, and smart guys like yourself were saying, texting is probably gonna be over pretty soon. Yeah, It's not gonna last that much longer. And I was looking back at some videos from like a year ago and everyone was saying that same thing. And now it, was, it kept going down and everyone was saying, yeah, are you getting these results too? Like mm -hmm. my response rate and my deliver deliverability rate is down by like 30% yeah. or whatever it was. And so I saw the writing on the wall. And at that point I said, I, I need to explore some other options for marketing mm -hmm. so I can diversify my risk a little bit, but also get something that gives me a better return with less people management. Right. Um, so who are you managing right now? Hopefully no one soon, but- You still have uh, to manage one person. Still one person. <laughs> uh, so I have uh, our, our our team right now is pretty lean. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a, a full-time VA in the Philippines. She's mm -hmm. a rock star. Um, I have a few other part-time VAs. I have a sign poster who's local for Bandit Signs. Mm -hmm. um, I just hired a chief integration officer. He just started on Monday. Um, he's a rock star. And he's he's once he's fully trained up, he's pretty much going to be running the day-to-day -day operations. Got it. And managing the people, mm -hmm. which he likes to do. Really? So for me, that's great. <laughs> that's weird. So bandit signs. Yep. You're still doing bandit signs. I am still doing bandit signs. You're still getting leads from it. Sometimes I forget about it. Yeah. Uh, the calls aren't frequent, mm -hmm. but the the lead to prospect ratio is really high on interesting. those. If someone calls those, they're probably pretty motivated. Very interesting. Um, so Ryan Kenyon wants to know, the process with doing TV, I guess, if someone wanted to do TV, any recommendations for them? They should talk to Darren. Yeah. Uh, Darren Dammy, he is with Bullseye Branding. Yeah. Um, there, so some really big names use use their uh, services. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a Doug lot of Hopkins being the biggest one. <laughs> Doug Hopkins, uh, Ryan Panita, mm -hmm. soon to be Steve Trang. Soon to be Steve Trang. Well, uh, really, Max Jimenez. Steve's behind the scenes. Okay. Max yeah. Jimenez, um, a bunch of other guys in our group, a lot of guys in CG. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a fully automated process, which for me was ideal because like I said, hate managing people. Yeah. And the simpler and leaner I can get it, the better. And so they do every, I mean, they all I had to do was show up for the shoot, for the, the commercial mm -hmm. and, and film that but they set that all up. They they talk to the stations, they do all the ad buys, and they do it really intelligently because they have data from all over the country and all the markets they're in. Maybe they're in, I don't know, 35 markets or so all around the country with, with other wholesalers. Yep. And they look at the call logs. When are people calling in? What numbers did they call? And they track that to what station that came from, what TV show, what time. And then they use that data to make good decisions for your ad buys. Right. I don't, I never decide what commercials, what times, how many slots. I never look at any of that stuff. You're not the guy. So I'm, I'm totally off hands, uh, off hand with that stuff. And all I have to do is, is get the leads when they come in. Yeah. Uh, and then what's the process from TV to close? I'm guessing when you sh lead comes in on a TV, mm -hmm. Generally, call in website. So, so I, I think it's seventy five percent will call, twenty five percent will do a web form, mm -hmm. and so we have our, our leads manager who's the first point of contact. They will qualify and disqualify those leads. If they're qualified, they'll move on to acquisitions where they set an appointment. And so right now, I'm doing all the acquisitions. So mm -hmm. I'm physically going to the the appointment to the house. Uh, if we get that under contract, um, then, well, he just asked through closing. So yeah. uh, goes through the traditional transactions coordination until closing. Um, unfortunately, New York is an attorney state and about the slowest 
state you can be in for real estate transactions. Uh, so, it, I mean, I have stuff that's my pipeline is full. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say that. Uh, and Jake Washburn wants to know if you aren't good at sales and you're a wholesaler solopreneur, what would you recommend? If you aren't good at sales, um, is he already in wholesaling or looking uh, to get into it? It sounds like he's already in it. Okay. Well, I would say lean on your strengths. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not great at sales, get someone who is. Um, put them on straight commission. Because if they don't produce, you're not paying them anything. Right. But if they are good at sales, they're going to be extra motivated because they're on commission. Mm -hmm. So if I guess if you don't want to hire someone, then you need to learn sales. Yeah. And you need to learn sales, sales from Steve. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. If you need to get good at sales, we basically like engineered <laughs> good sales program. Yeah. Took our engineering brain and applied it to sales. Um, so David wants to know about predictive index. Yeah. I'll definitely send you guys a link later on for, for predictive index. Um, it's expensive. Predictive index is expensive if, you, if you're buying it for yourself. Yeah, if you're buying it for yourself, but we can give them a free test. But it's worth it. Absolutely. If you're worth hiring it. a team, it is worth it. Yeah. Like the, the cost, do you know what it is? A cost of a bad hire is how much? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know the stats, but it's usually a lot more than the cost of the employee. Oh, yeah. It's like, what is it, like 150% of their yearly salary or mm -hmm. something like that? It's, yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's really important to get right. And as entrepreneurs, we're impatient. Yeah. We don't want to do it right. <laughs> and so you got to use this. You got to get it right because if you, a wrong hire is actually more expensive yeah. than the program itself. Uh, Samuel wants to know, what, what was your success like with Facebook ads? So this probably isn't a good representation uh, because for anyone that's read uh, traction or anything by Gino Wickman. So I'm a visionary all day. Scored a 97 out of 100 on the visionary scale. So in terms of the the fine details, what did you score on the visionary scale? 97. <laughs> okay. 97 or 98. It was one of those. <laughs> Very high. Yeah. So in terms of details, that's not me. Yeah. So I took I, I took information and that someone else was doing and having success with and, and sort of just let that run mm -hmm. um but in terms of constantly tweaking things and monitoring the stats and every, that stuff just drives me nuts yeah um so i sort of set it and let it go i know that's not the way i should do it so that's mm -hmm. why i actually sort of stopped doing facebook ads right now until i have someone that can do that because you, um, you were not being responsible with your marketing dollars i wasn't so i well that and really with tv right now I'm getting more leads than I can handle. Yeah. So I didn't need to be wasting money, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when I wasn't monitoring it. Yeah. So I was spending this money on on Facebook ads, not a ton, like 50 bucks a day, but mm -hmm. it adds up. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't really being responsible with the stats on it. So I turned it off and I will turn it back on once my team can handle the increase in leads and once I have someone who can track that, track all the stats, figure out where we should be and making those tweaks on a regular basis to make sure we're being responsible with that marketing dollar. Absolutely. Um, George Gutierrez wants to know what county do you target? So right now we're just in Monroe County. So in Rochester. But soon to be. Yeah, so within the next 12 months, uh, we're gonna be also in Buffalo and Syracuse, New York. It'd be king of Western New York. That's right. Um, at some point, maybe they'll call it Danbro Stadium <laughs> or wherever the Bills play. Uh, uh, Shane Imsen wants to know, what's the monthly spend for your TV presence currently? So all in with the marketing fee and the ad spend, I'm at 13500 Yeah. Not very much. For what it brings in, it's not. Yeah. It's, uh, and the leads are hot. Yeah. They are hot. Uh, if someone's calling a TV lead, I mean, it's not, it takes lead to a whole nother level. Cause if you, if you think about like a text lead, mm -hmm. it's not even, it's orange apples and oranges. Yeah. So a text lead is just someone who says, yeah, I, I want to sell. Mm -hmm. But when someone calls based on your commercial, 
they're probably going to be pretty motivated. Yeah. So it's like a PPC lead. Um, there's usually going to be very little competition. These aren't lists you can buy a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Or if they would be on a list, they're not on it yet mm -hmm. because it happened so recently. So a lot of times on these TV leads, they're not talking to anybody else. Right. It's they, exclusive. They haven't. So there's no, I'm not in a bidding war. Yeah. It, it's, it's great. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, Warner Kiroga wants to know, where can he get a nice plaid shirt like the one you have on? I got this at, uh, my wife ordered the trunk club for me. Yeah. Well, I think what we should do is we should sign it and then sell it to him. I'll sell it to him. Yeah. I think for the right cool. price. <laughs> uh, all right. Ernesto wants to know how much were you spending a month on Facebook leads and how many leads were you getting? So we were doing 50 bucks a day on lead generation and then another, I think it was only like $8 a day on, on retargeting. Um, I did that for a few months. I think I got like three or four deals out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't bad, but it the timing for me wasn't right. I'll do it again uh, when I have someone to monitor it. Yeah, and it's something we've talked about as well is we have to change it because now it's gotta be branded. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You gotta flood that branding. Uh, Claude Moss wants to know, how much are you spending on TV ads, which you already talked about, uh, 13.5? 13.5. And are you using a cable network? They, so I think right now we're on three or four different channels. I, the main, you know, whatever the main ones are right now, it might be Fox, ABC, NBC, I don't yeah. know, all the main ones. They're the ma major networks is where those TV spots go. Yeah. Um, so not guys keep I post your questions happy to answer them um so tangent your dad was a franchisee for tony robbins yeah what was that like growing up well i was one so i don't remember <laughs> uh but i know he i think he was just in the rochester area but he if my memory serves me correctly i think he was the number one franchisee in the country and mm -hmm. he so he won uh a trip to Fiji with Tony. Wow. Yeah. So he's been in Fiji that long. Tony Robbins. Yeah. He's had that resort for 30 years. Yeah, because I remember him. Like, I think it was one of his DVDs or, or CDs, and it was that um, he bought a place in Fiji mm -hmm. just so his friends could come and hang out. Yeah. It's pretty solid. Yeah, that's, that, that's the place. Yeah, it's probably a little bit more expensive now than it was 30 years <laughs> right. ago. Um, let's see. We kind of talked about it a little bit, but maybe this is different. What is your biggest struggle right now? I would say two things, and it's probably pretty similar for most entrepreneurs is people. So managing people, but finding the right people. Mm hmm because the wrong people can ruin your business and make yeah. your life miserable. Yeah. Um, so finding, you know, a lot of people have probably, who is it, Jim Collins, the right, right people on the bus in mm -hmm. the right seats. So, and that's where having these tools like Predictive Index goes a really long way. Making sure that first off, you have the right people on your, in your company and that they're, they're a values fit. That's probably number one, mm -hmm. is that they're a values fit. Not that they have the skill set, you can teach skills. Mm -hmm. You can't teach values. Someone's either a good person or they're not. Right. They either have similar values to you or they don't. And so if you're not a match there, it's probably going to cause some friction. Mm -hmm. So people management, getting the right people on the team and training them properly, holding them accountable, all the people management stuff that I hate doing <laughs> that I recently <laughs> hired someone for. Yeah. Um, that's one of my biggest struggles. The other one is balancing the time and and the almost opposing motivations of growing the business, doing more, getting bigger, making more money versus almost slowing down, handing off some of the reins, spending more time on relationships with my family. Those things clash. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, coming back to that front row dads, like, it's a community where that's these guys are all dealing with that. 
Mm -hmm. but they've come up with these strategies to deal with it really effectively. Yeah. And so just learning from other people is so key. Like there's so many people I know they go to YouTube university and they look at all these different people who are doing all this great stuff and they're they're but they're stuck in education mode mm -hmm. and they don't put it into action. It doesn't matter. Education doesn't matter that much. It matters what you're actually doing Yeah. because theory is not the same as reality, right? I can, I can know how to drive. I, you know, theoretically know how to drive an F1 race car, mm -hmm. <laughs> put me in it. Yeah. I, no. <laughs> well, we kind of drove one earlier. <laughs> we did. It was amazing. Yeah. Teslas are awesome. <laughs> uh, what is your superpower? Taking action. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the, the predictive index just sort of solidified that for me that I have a real tough time slowing down. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, even if something isn't perfect, I know it's not going to be perfect, but I'm going to go, I'm going to try, I'm going to do it. I'm going to work every day to make it a little bit better each day. Yeah. And so, you know, this past year, you know, I was, so I got back into that medical device job and then I said, well, I can't, it, then COVID hit. I said, I couldn't, I can't do nothing. Mm -hmm. I have to do something. I have to take some action, got into real estate again in, in wholesaling and started taking action on that. That started going really well. And I decided to leave that stable good really good job again again <laughs> twice <laughs> um but i was able to do that because i was taking consistent action mm -hmm. again not massive action it was right. consistent action it's it's your daily habits that make the difference it's it's like anything it's like working out like you can't go to the gym one time work your butt off and then you're in great shape yeah you have to do it every week you have to do it multiple times a week Consistently, yeah, <laughs> every day. Do uh, was it do rents due every day? Every day, yeah. Uh, so Warner wants to know what does the next five years look like for Dan Bro. So the next twelve months uh, plans are to double what we're doing in Rochester, mm -hmm. and then also expand into Buffalo and Syracuse and be doing a little bit less than what we're doing right now in both of those cities. Yeah. So that's the next year. Um, after that, I want to purely step into a visionary and owner role for the wholesaling business. And then I'm going to get into some other things. Um, I want to I do coaching. I love coaching. Uh, it's something I've been doing for a long time. I wanted to get, I want to get into that space. Um, I want to get into some bigger holds like storage facilities, mm -hmm. uh, self storage facilities. I want to get into that. Um, and really free up my time and energy so that I can focus on my unique abilities, the things that I'm the best at and give me the most energy. Yeah. So that I can have that choice. And I'm not doing stuff that's so time sensitive, like answering calls, answering emails, going on appointments, the stuff that is so time specific that almost handcuffs me from spending my time how I really want to when the opportunity arises. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you know, it might be a beautiful day and I want to spend that time with my family. Well, if I have a bunch of calls or emails or appointments, I can't do that. Yeah. So for me, it's getting my business to that point where I'm owning a business, not running a business. And then I have choice and time and flexibility, which is a big reason why a lot of people, I think, get into entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't get there because they get so sidetracked by growth. Yeah, they get bogged down, lose sight. Um, Mike Higgins wants to know, what's your personal um, morning routine? My personal morning routine. Um, so it's been a little different lately because I have a seven week old. Uh, so mornings are a little more difficult than mm -hmm. normal. Um, but my wife has taken on the vast majority of the responsibility there, so I can't complain too much. Mm -hmm. She's a rock star. Yeah. Um, but I, so I've learned a lot of different things. There's different breathing exercises. Um, one one's called box breathing, and it's it's a you it's I, typically done to a four count. It can be done to any interval, mm -hmm. but it's you you inhale for four 
hold for four, exhale for four, hold for four. Mm -hmm. It's very energizing and relaxing and it sort of centers you. Um, I do, I have my, my morning questions, my power questions. You can ask, there's a ton of different questions, but it's all, you know, what am I grateful for? What am I excited about? Why is today gonna be great? Why am I so lucky? Why am I, all these positive things, because when, you know, th this is all Tony Robbins stuff, mm. that those questions. If you ask yourself a question, your mind will come up with an answer. Yeah. So you might as well ask a better question. Ask good questions. Not, why do I have to get up so early? Mm -hmm. Why is it so cold out? <laughs> why is the world the way it is? Those are crappy questions. You're gonna mm. get a crappy answer. Mm -hmm. But if you ask good questions every single day, what am I happy about? What am I really excited about today? How does that make me feel? You're going to be jazzed for the day. Yeah. You're going to be feeling really good because the first hour of the day, you know, the golden hour, it's 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 the rudder of the day. It sets the the direction for the rest of your day. So if you start out and, you, and the first thing you do is is you go on and you check your email and you check Facebook, you're starting off the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're 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 starting off by you're comparing yourself to other people. You're you're going to be wanting what they want, what they have, or what it looks like they have. You're going to be dealing with issues right off the bat. Take a little time for yourself. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself good questions. I work out first thing in the morning. I get me time in. I mean, I take care of the dogs and everything too. Um, but I really I hold that time sacred. And it's the most important time of the day. That and right before bed, asking yourself those same questions. And it, it, they can be the same questions, they can be different, but they need to be empowering questions. And that stuff will feed into your subconscious the whole night. And making that stuff a habit, starting off, you'll probably have to write it out, do it in a journal. After a while, it'll just be routine. When I lay in bed, those, pop, those questions just pop into my head mm. it, it, because I've been doing it so long. So that's that's the routine that that I have that I know a lot of other people have and have had great success with it. Yeah, that box method is interesting because that's what Tony Robbins talks about, and I think in Person of Power too. Uh, so <laughs> it's not like you've gone and changed the formula; you're still doing it. Right. Um, David Lamb has an interesting question: um, How did you get to that consistent habit to create that snowball effect? And it might you might have touched a little bit on your morning routine, but like how 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 do you ensure that you're consistent and he, he points he points us out because right now he's stuck in youtube university yeah so so if, i'll take this from their perspective of he's stuck in youtube university trying to figure out when he can make that leap to actually mm -hmm. taking action at some point it's going to be a leap there's gonna there's no guarantees you will mess up you experience you're going to mess up a lot <laughs> There's no avoiding that, mm -hmm. but you have to take action because it doesn't matter how much you know if you don't put it to work. So at some point, whether it's just taking a chance and just putting something on your calendar, by this date, no matter where I'm at, this is what I'm doing. I'm getting to this point. I'm going to, and you don't have to, it, it, maybe you have a regular job right now, I don't know. but. Don't quit your job right away. Mm -hmm. I was in. I was doing real estate pretty much full time while I had another full time job for a full year, and and saved up a good amount of money. So I made a pretty safe decision. Other people wouldn't think it was safe because I was leaving a six figure job, mm -hmm. but I was still smart about it. But you, you have to just take a leap at some point. You yeah. can't keep waiting. There's never going to be a perfect time. Never. Something is always going to pop up. It's always a reason not to. And I think that's what I've told some people when they're like, when's the right time to quit? And I tell them, well, this is, when's the right time to get married? Right. When's the right time to have kids? Never. There's no <laughs> right time. It's never a good just time. <laughs> pick a date and you just go with it. Yeah. So. The world isn't going to stop. It's not going to slow down. It's Stuff's not gonna, always going to be happening. It's definitely not going to stop for you. Right. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to ask a question. Uh, and this is just purely for me mm -hmm. it's going to replay this later on yeah so knowing what you know now was it worth 
working with Max and me. Oh my gosh. And signing up on the Disruptor Blueprint system. Gosh. Giving me softballs here. <laughs> I've I've said it once, I'll say it again. Signing up with your program was the best business decision I ever made. It completely changed my business. It took me from a point where I really didn't like wholesaling because I didn't like the process. Mm -hmm. I felt like the sellers that I was working with didn't love the experience. I always felt like bringing my buyers through to show the property was a little awkward and though I just never felt great about it. Mm -hmm. Now, man, these sellers, they are so thankful. They love me. They, I, they call me their savior, their hero. They're, they are so thankful and they enjoy the process so much more because I have a better process yeah. and I put it into work. And I, I mean, probably 95% of what I do is what I learned in your program. And it's, I mean, for I know there are a lot of programs out there there are guys steve is not paying me for for this uh this is just me saying this honestly that uh i know there are a lot of programs out there steve is one of the best sales trainers in the game anywhere he is the sales trainer for one of the biggest mastermind groups that has these big players that are yeah. trying to sell you their programs too <laughs> he's training them so what does that tell you i i mean it, it can't it doesn't get any better than steve and one other thing I would say is that any good, consistent coach, look at any Vince Lombardi, John mm. Wooden, any of these guys, they drill the fundamentals consistently. Right. And so many of these courses are so appealing and so sexy because they're trying to teach this fancy stuff that is five levels beyond the basics. Mm -hmm. That's not where people need to start. That's not what's gonna get you to that next level. What's gonna get you to that next level is being really, really good at the fundamentals. Yeah. And we, this program will get you really good at the fundamentals. It's a blueprint for wholesaling success. It will give you, if you follow what Steve tells you and you put it into action consistently, and you keep trying to get a little bit better and you practice, you will drastically change your business and you will wonder why you didn't do it years ago. Yeah. So thank you for that. I yeah. probably should pay you for that. Um, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to leave, uh, What think about what thought you wanna leave listeners with while I make a couple of quick announcements. Guys, again, if you got value today, please like, subscribe, share, comment, it really helped us a lot because that's what the algorithms want to see. Um, and then next week we got uh, Brian Snyder and Brett Snodgrass flying in to talk about their business. Um, and then again, yeah, we get the workshop, right? Disruptors.com, go there, see if you qualify. Our workshop's gonna be November 14th and 15th. So last thoughts. Yeah, I would say other than everything, if I'm gonna add something new, mm -hmm. Anyone who's in this business or, or any business, treat it like a business. Because I, I would put money that if you were to take any of the guys that have been on, on your show, take them out of real estate wholesaling, put them in another business, they would have success. Because they know how to run a business. Mm -hmm. And they've set up the systems and they've learned how to hire people and evaluate people and do marketing and sales. They know how to run a business. And so many people, I think, struggle in wholesaling and say it doesn't work because they're not actually running a business. Right. They haven't learned how to do that yet. And so you need to treat it like it's a regular business, like any other. It's not some hobby you can just do half ass. Yeah. It, you, if it's going to take work, any business is going to take work. This one just happens to have higher margins. Yeah. So the things you see on YouTube and on social media are totally possible. There are plenty of people doing it, but they're doing it because they have great businesses and they work their butts off. Right. So take that consistent action, 
run a real business, and if you don't know how, learn how. Because there are a lot of people that can teach you. Yeah. Steve is one of them. Steve, honestly, if you guys are looking into programs, if you're looking into coaching programs, you're trying to get started in wholesaling or take your game to the next level, book a call with Steve. He's a, he's an awesome guy, an awesome coach. The, the program is incredible. It will give you, I haven't calculated the return. I probably should have. But for, for how much I paid, I would have paid so much more for the yeah. program. Well, I appreciate that. For someone that wants to get a hold of you, how would they do that? They can find me on Instagram at Action Dan Bro. With an O. B R O. Because <laughs> everyone would pronounce it wrong if I spelled it the right way. <laughs> it's not Brault. It looks like Brault. It looks like Brault. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you. This was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, see we real estate disruptors Can't nobody touch us And yeah, we about to give you game Shout out to Steve Train Real estate disruptors They cannot touch us And yeah, we about to give you game Shout out to Steve Train Jump on the Steve Train We about to give you game R.E.I.'s flowing through my veins And you don't have to look no further See right here, you gon' learn everything Yeah, see we real estate disruptors 